Social influence was at work in Milgram's obedience studies where subjects obeyed orders to deliver apparently lethal shocks to a stranger. Likewise, the social situation provoked aggression in the Stanford prison study where ordinary students acting as guards behaved with br brutality toward fellow students in the role of prisoners. And still other research has shown that aggressive behavior can be induced by situations that create prejudice, conformity, frustration, threat, or wounded pride. Well then, how do we define aggression? We commonly use the word aggression to mean assertiveness or competitiveness or forward or risk-taking behavior or dominant or powerful or angry people. Some psychologists define aggression as the intent to do harm to another person. However, it's very hard to measure intention. In fact, most trials, the biggest problem is to prove the intention of the person on trial. So why don't we just say doing harm to others instead? Because harming someone without the intent to, be, to do, do harm is not aggression. It's an accident. But intending to do harm, whether that harm was actualized, is aggressive thinking. So we define intent in our definition of aggression, the intent to do harm to another. There are two major types of aggression. There's hostile aggression and instrumental aggression. The first, hostile aggression, is anger-based, and its goal is to injure a specific person. The means of expression is direct aggression, face-to-face, in-your-face type of aggression. The other is instrumental aggression. Again, it's anger-based, but it's injuring another as a means to another goal. So I might be mad at you, but you're much bigger and you can beat me up. However, you have a younger sister and I can hurt your younger sister, or I can mess up your car. This is instrumental aggression. It's indirect aggression, behind your back type of aggression. It's also considered social aggression in teenage girls. The two theoretical perspectives on aggression come from Freud and a biologist called Lorenz. Freud's psychodynamic perspective says that we all possess an innate drive for sex and aggression. The two are inescapable. Society functions to inhibit the direct expression of these urges, so we seek socially acceptable means to express them. For sex, we use creativity and the arts, and for aggression, we can use sports or competition. This idea comes from the idea of the of the dam holding back water. The dam is built to a specific specification that allows a certain amount of water to hold behind the dam. If there's more water than the specification, the dam bursts. So there's always some pressure relief valves in the dam to allow the water out so that a lot of water doesn't build up behind the dam and cause damage to the dam. Well, that's the same idea here in Freud's idea, we have aggressive tendencies that build up in us, and we have to release those tendencies, and that's called catharsis. And we can achieve catharsis either vicariously, by watching somebody else beat up someone in a boxing match or in a sports competition, or we can do it directly by going out and killing weeds or uh, shooting animals. But one way or another, we have to get rid of the energy that's building up in our body. Lorenz is a little bit different, but very similar. Lorenz is a sociobiologist, and his perspective is that aggression is innate, just like Freud said, it's built into us, it's necessary. But he also added the word adaptive, and adaptive means that in the past, somehow, this aggressive tendency must have been useful for our ancestors, and therefore we have it today because our ancestors survived and passed it down to us. So genes for aggression are passed along, whereas genes for passivity are not, because a passive person in the past died and didn't get to have children and didn't pass on their genes. 
situational or environmental cues will interact with our genetics and our genetic predispositions and that will cause us to become aggressive. So arousal is also caused by hormones and a situational cue in the environment will trigger this particular aggressive tendency. It is hardwired. It is not learned. So what are the roots of prejudice, aggression, violence, and terrorism, and how do we combat them? We have seen evidence that a leader can sway a group to behave in a manner that's inconsistent with the norm, especially if that leader has antisocial tendencies. We have seen that intolerance can be averted through greater understanding. We've also seen that the power of the situation can help us understand violence and terrorism. There are experiments that have been performed to create prejudicial, violent, combative behaviors within groups, and we've, we've viewed one of those experiments, the Stanford Prison Experiment with Dr. Zimbardo. Other experiments have gone a step further in an attempt to better understand the roots of social conflict and how to end the behavior once it is started. In the Robbers Cave experiment, the researchers attempted to create a situation where two different groups of people hated each other and had aggressive tendencies toward each other and then purposely tried to repair the rift that they created between these two groups. So the settings of Boy Scout camp and the area is called the Robbers Cave and that's why it's called the Robbers Cave Experiment and the experimenters Musafra and Sharif uh, and their colleagues assigned 11 and 12 year old boys to two different groups dubbed the Eagles and the Rattlers. The experiment called for the conditions that were very similar to those of many other summer camps for boys. There were days filled with compet competitive games and, and activities and the experimenters hoped that competition would create conflict between the two groups but they didn't just leave it at that. Initially the Eagles and Rattlers, the two groups, were kept apart from each other, allowing within group activities to build some sort of group cohesiveness amongst the Rattlers and amongst the Eagles so that you were proud to be a Rattler or, or proud to be an Eagle and you had connections to other people in the group. So this is solidarity, loyalty, and a sense of group membership. Later, the experimenters brought the two groups together for com competitions such as tug of war and football and prizes for the winners heightened the competitive atmosphere. This is not one of those places where you get a prize simply for competing. You are either the loser or the winner. If you didn't win, you are the loser. So that created a heightened competitive atmosphere. The final straw was a party at which the experimenters arranged to have the Eagles arrive an hour early. So they told the Eagles, this uh, party's going to start at 7 o'clock, but they told the Rattlers, the party's going to start at 8 o'clock. Well, this party had some wonderful mouth-watering foods, had um, appealing cakes and cookies and brownies. It also had the horrible vegetables, the broccolis, the cauliflowers, the celery, and when the Rattlers got to the meeting, to the party, you can guess, the Eagles had eaten all of the good food and the only food that was left was the bad food. Well, what do you do with bad food? There's only one thing you really can do if you're an 11 or 12 year old, and that is throw it at everybody. And so that's exactly what happened. As you might expect, uh, there was a food fight and a lot of scuffling and name calling now they had definitely created an atmosphere where one group definitely hated the other group. So now they had an atmosphere where one group specifically hated the other group. And at this point where most other experiments stopped, Sharif wanted to find out how can we get the two groups back together again? What would promote cooperation between the groups? And what did help to reduce tension and rivalry was to contrive situations in which the groups had to cooperate in order to serve their own interests. Something went wrong, both groups were going to suffer because of it, and it would take both groups to figure out the problem. So first the experimenters called a halt to the competitive games, 
and then they assembled the boys to inform that there was a problem that had developed with the camp's vital water line. Now remember, the boys think that they're way out in the middle of nowhere. You cannot survive without water, and so they have to get the water working. Both groups agreed to search the line for the trouble spot, which they did together harmoniously. And although, of course, this doesn't work immediately, it did promote some interactions between the two groups. So to serve its own needs, each group had to cooperate with the so-called enemy. And as dissonance theory would predict, hostility changed to friendliness. The change in behavior led to a change in attitude, and the attitude change resulted from the need according to cognitive dissonance theory, to justify by thinking changing their thought processes, their altered forced behavior. It took several such crises to break down the hostility barriers between the two groups and to build a sense of mutual interdependence and a working relationship was based on shared goals between the two groups. But in the end, the groups actively sought opportunities to mingle with each other and friendships developed between members of the Eagles and Rattlers. And by the end of their time together, one group, the Eagles, pooled their money together and bought treats for the members of the other group, the Rattlers, who at the party had lost the opportunity to get treats because the Eagles had eaten them all up. This is considered pro-social behavior. So let's talk about pro-social behavior. It's a commentary on our society that we have so many names for massive negative events, crises, catastrophe, calamity, devastation, all kinds of different ways to define a massive negative event, but not only, but only one single word that is used to define a massive positive event and that is a miracle. At least psychologists define positive behavior, although very few study it, it is called pro-social behavior. This is any action intended to benefit another person or group. It is positive, constructive, and helpful behavior. It's the opposite of antisocial behavior, and it's behaviors that are carried out with the goal of helping other people. There is one special type of pro-social behavior where the animal does not consider its own safety, and that's called altruism. And in most cases, we think of altruistic animals, not altruistic people. However, there are a few cases of altruism within humanity as well. So the definition of altruism is any action intended solely to benefit another and thus not to gain external or internal rewards. It is unselfish, positive regard for the welfare of others. It is pro-social behavior that a person carries out without considering his or her own safety or interests. And possibly we could consider Sister Teresa and the Dalai Lama as two human beings who do altruistic work. They have nothing of their own. They have no, they don't own anything and they do things for other people. We usually call people who perform such feats heroes or heroines. Although when asked, a hero will usually say they did not think about it and it was a stupid thing to do, whatever it was that their behavior was that made them into a hero or heroine. So the definition of a hero or heroic act might be one that is done on the spur of the moment without thinking about it placing the individual in great peril, and in which the person miraculously survives. That is not really a very complimentary definition of a hero or a heroine. In evolutionary bio biology, altruism is used to define the behavior of animals that risk their lives for the family or group unit, decreasing their productivity. So in evolutionary biology, an organism is said to behave altruistically when its behavior benefits other organisms at a cost to itself. And that cost and, and benefit uh, is measured in terms of reproductive fitness or productivity or expected number of offspring. So by behaving altruistically, an organism reduces its own amount of offspring it is likely to produce 
but it boosts the number that other organisms like it are going to produce. So in other words, it gives up its life in order for the rest of the colony to survive. That's one of the main benefits of our uh, behaviors that we would call altruistic behavior. The biological notion of altruism is not identical to the everyday concept because in everyday speech, an action would only be called altruistic if it was done with the conscious intention of helping another person. But in the biological sense, there's no such requirement. We don't give conscious algorithmic thinking to our animal friends. Let's take the vervet monkey for an example. They give alarm calls to warn the fellow monkeys of the presence of predators, even though in doing so, they attract the attention to themselves of those predators, increasing their personal chance of being attacked. They actually have a sound that makes all vervet monkeys go up into the trees, which means that that sound says that there is something on the ground, there's a predator on the ground. There's another sound they make that all the vervet monkeys will come out of the trees onto the ground, meaning there's a predator in the air, so they're getting away from the air predator. You can record these recordings, take them anywhere in the world where there's vervet monkeys, and play those sounds, and the vervet monkeys will go up and down the trees. As you play the sounds, you're forcing the monkeys up and down the trees. Obviously, one group didn't speak to another group. They don't have the same language. This is a built-in mechanism built into the vervet monkeys. In social insect colonies, there's ants and wasps and bees and termites. The workers, or every single one of the workers, is sterile. The only one who produces eggs and therefore continues the colony is the queen. But the workers do all the work to make sure that the colony survives. And so they've given up total reproductive fitness in order for the colony to survive. Such behavior is maximally altruistic. Their actions greatly assist the reproductive efforts of their species, their queen. And so we end the study of social psychology on a positive note on altruism. And I hope that you also will consider, if not altruistic behaviors, at least pro-social behaviors to help your fellow species survive.